Thank you. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here at this conference talking to all the people who have been working on this AMP story. We've been doing this pretty much uh, for the whole of last year, and it's a great pleasure to meet everybody else who's been thinking about the same thing. And what I'll try to give you is an overview of how I think the whole black hole story ought to work. So it's pretty much of an outline. I don't have time to go into too much detail of any one thing, but you know I'm here the whole two weeks, and we should meet and chat about anything that you want to talk about in more detail. So uh, this is what I'll do. I'll first give you a brief summary, just like uh, of the order of five or six slides, laying out what I think is the story, which I say has four twists. So if we don't realize it has four twists to the story, and we stop, let's say, at twist three, then we might think, for example, there is a firewall. So you know, that's why I want to take you through the four iterations. And then I'll tell you how I think information comes out of the black hole. And that's the kind of stuff we've been working on for many years. A lot of people have been trying to make this thing called the first ball construction. And then if you have all these first balls, how can you escape seeing a firewall? So that goes into something called first ball complementarity, which is something we had tried to make uh, about three years ago. And put together, I think, uh, these two things give us a picture of how this very bizarre sounding thing that uh, Tooth and Susskind had talked about in the early 90s you can actually see something close to that really coming out of string theory. And I think uh, I've always found it very interesting. But of course, then the question is, does the AMPS argument shoot it down? And it turns out the first ball complementarity was a little different from uh, the simplest way you might think complementarity should work. And uh, when you check it out, what you find, and that's the latest paper we had on the web a couple of months ago, uh, you actually find that uh, this, doesn't, uh, this escapes the AMPS argument. So that's essentially what I'll be telling you. At the end, I want to come and tell you a little bit about recasting uh, local physics. Up to here, I'm just using string theory in the way I know it as a local theory. People have often talked about in many different contexts. There might be non-local effects uh, in gravity that are going to help with the black hole problem. And so I don't know what non-local effects there are in the Lagrangian, because I don't think the Lagrangian has any. But the local effects you get here can somehow be, in a way which I'll discuss, be recast as non-local effects. And I'll just have to discuss that issue with you uh, uh, at the end, uh, briefly in a slide. OK, so let's begin with the brief uh, summary. And I said it's a story with four iterations. And the story goes like this. If you take the Schwarzschild metric, when you initially wrote it down, you see a singularity at the horizon. So if you do a quantum field theory in this metric in these coordinates, everything will start going pretty violent near the horizon. So you might think there is a problem. Okay, so that kind of thing might have motivated the first uh, things on complementarity some frame you can come out and so on. Because there might be something happening there. Coordinate-wise, it looks like a problem. But of course, we'll soon realize this is only a coordinate singularity. You go to crystal coordinates, and you can go in. And in fact, it was found black holes have no hair. So in fact, this kind of smooth geometry, is spherically symmetric and all, is the only solution we had. And now it seems that nothing happens at the horizon. OK, so let's go to the, uh, what the problem with that is. So now if here nothing happens at the horizon, that's where Hawking came up and told us about his paradox. You, the metric produces these entangled pairs, and the entanglement keeps growing between inside and outside. So this is what Hawking said in a you know, cartoon form. If the horizon is a normal place like the lab, then we can have an entanglement problem. We will have an entanglement problem by this pair creation. So you can call this Hawking prime, an equivalent statement. This is the prime over here. Uh, if you don't want an entanglement problem, you need something non-trivial to happen at the horizon. I'm just restating in cartoon form what Hawking said. OK, so you might wonder if the Hawking argument was really rigorous because it was very you know, approximate and you know, done by leading order in some fashion. And actually, it turns out, uh, using strong subjectivity, you can prove that the entangled problem is actually stable to small corrections. So if you have a small correction, it could even be non-local on the scale of the entire black hole, but they are small. So to leading order the area near the horizon, it looks like this room. Then if you make these small corrections, the entanglement actually just keeps growing and growing. And so it doesn't matter what the epsilons are. It's not going to help you. And if that is the case, then Hawking, in fact, has got us in a bit of a bind. Because now we are sandwiched between two problems. On the one hand, we can't find any hair. So the, we have no structure. The horizon looks like the vacuum wave functional out there. And on the other hand, if there is no structure of the horizon, then you can't solve the entanglement problem. You keep producing the pairs. And it's stable to all kind of small things we would have done. And so uh, you know, what are you going to do? OK. So in the third iteration, let's see if we can solve the problem. And the problem is that, in fact, out of these two possibilities, 
it's the possibility A which ends up breaking. In string theory, you actually manage to find the hair. And if you actually look at the way string microstates behave, starting with some very simple states and then going out to more and more complicated states, it appears the picture of microstates is actually somewhat interesting. So the simplest way to describe what might be happening, because there are many duality frames and so on, you just take a frame where you have a compact circle, and the compact circle normally is basically tensored in with everything, so you forget it and you know, say, let's deal with 3 plus 1 gravity. But actually something interesting can happen. As you come close to the horizon, the circle goes and pinches off like a cigar. Yes? Samir, I don't, I don't want to interrupt too much too early, but um, I'd like to separate what is known from what is, is a scenario. But you, you said we find hair. Have you found hair for the Schwarzschild black hole? No, no. So everything's scenario. Why don't you just scenario, say scenario. Okay, thank in, you. in this whole talk, everything's scenario. Okay. This particular scenario assumes a circle in the extra dimension? Yes, in this particular duality frame, you have a circle in the extra dimension. Yeah. It's not always a circle in the extra dimension. Either. Right. Okay. Because actually people have often usually work with uh, duality frames where you just, this sort of makes what's called a KK monopole here, but you can dualize that to brains and most of the work of Bina and Warner uses. But I mean, there, there's not always a duality frame in which there's a circle, just for the record, but, but okay, please go. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. Take everything as a cartoon because we just want to get some ideas down and uh, I'll make a second pass at everything and then you can certainly ask me a little more. So anyway, the compact dimensions come and they sort of pinch off like this. And of course, the compact dimension pinches off. There is structure and you know, there's a lot of more structure. There are fluxes between them and all kinds of string theory sources can come in there. And in the end, the structure can be different for different states. And uh, the cartoon version of the uh, entire conjecture would then be that all the states sort of look like this. There's no interior, nothing in there. It's a little bit like Witten's bubble of nothing, except the bubble of nothing was spherically symmetric and had a faulty boundary condition of fermions uh, when it pinched off. But here, because there's a twist to make it a KK monopole, it's completely fine for the fermions. Uh, you know, they, these are real f full solutions. And uh, you can actually make, uh, the conjecture would be, you can make all states in some fashion like this. They come and pinch off different ways, uh, angular directions pinch off in different ways. All the different ways to do that are all the microstates. Let's suppose for the moment that that were true, what picture do we get? But for simple states, they've also completed the Hawking radiation, and the radiation rates are exactly what you want, but this time this guy radiates like a piece of coal, so there's no entanglement problem. So if you want to see more about the story of what is done, that would be a, like a full fuzzball talk, which this one is not, but uh, there will be Bina talking more about fuzzballs, and uh, David also talk a little bit about the fuzzball construction, the recent work uh, which he's been doing with me, and otherwise, uh, please catch me in the rest of the week to talk about fuzzballs. But suppose you find all this hair, was the question? Yeah. Is this different than, let's say, the membrane paradigm or saying that? It is not. It's exactly. So I think what has happened is, yeah. Look, but, but no, there's one important comment for me to make here. Good. I'm glad you asked me that. In the membrane paradigm, as it was originally formulated, it was an imaginary membrane. So the purpose was people wanted to find out, for astrophysical purposes, what would happen to the magnetic fields around a black hole. Now, because you have GTT going to zero at the surface of a black hole, there's a certain boundary condition and magnetic field lines get frozen. Now, it's a difficult way to take the limits, you know, GTT going to zero when you take the limits of all the fields in the Lagrangian. But if you make an imaginary membrane just outside and give it appropriate properties, okay, you get all the boundary conditions in an easy way. And so it's a technical tool. Now, I think here we have seen something different. And the you know, stretched horizon also was. Not a technical tool in the way I used it. it was exactly. So you wanted something to be really there which would come and bounce things off like information, right? Could, um, whatever the, uh, Juan has suggested to me that whenever I try to understand fuzzballs, I just um, get rid of the word fuzzball and just use microstates of the black hole, whatever you they should, are. You can do that. Yes, Good. yes. Okay. Yes. So the point here would be that when you make microstates of the black hole, people have tried to make look for microstates for a long time. People look for hair, like can we deform the standard black hole to get any other kind of state? And as I'll come back and say in the slightly later slides, it's very difficult to get hair because the black hole, the people tried a lot, but the black hole sucks everything in. What actually happened was when we started looking at these microstates in detail one by one, this, in fact, the simplest, the first time we found that things can actually pinch off in this fashion goes back to a metric made by Maldusina and Maus and Baal Subrin Metal long ago. And you find that this, when a circle comes and pinches off and space-time ends, that's how you manage to escape this problem that you, everything will get sucked in. It's not like there's space-time on both sides and something is you're trying to hang something there. That never works. What happens is more like a bubble of nothing and space-time actually ended. 
And this is the way the, the microstates actually came out. These indeed are microstates. And if you like, this is what I would be calling the first part of the complementarity game. You actually get the stretched horizon as something with real so, degrees you know, of freedom. So it's not a coordinate I, artifact. When it's you, just real degrees of freedom. When you say the radiation rate agrees with when you say the radiation rate agrees with Hawking radiation, that would imply to me that you've calculated the entropy and gotten the right entropy no, no. from this calculation. I'll show you what it did. I have some slides on it later on. I'll show you the actual calculation. I'll show you what we did. We take specific the states. The rate is, is a thermal rate, right? No, no. Specific microstates in string theory to radiate, of free microstates radiate a little bit differently, right? So we take a certain microstate in the CFT. We identify which one it is. We know how much radiation we expect from that one. We take its corresponding gravity construction, and we see what's the radiation from that gravity construction. And you can see the whole information of that state coming out in the actual evaporation. But I, I can show it to you. I have some slides at the end, but uh, this was just my first pass. Yes, please. Actually, I think Gary's next. OK, and then, then you. Yes. Yeah, I, I just think to avoid confusion, and the, I mean, we've discussed this, but yes. to avoid confusion, could you state whether you think the fuzzballs will all be described by classical supergravity solutions or are much no, more I think, quantum? No, I think that's a, a misnomer. There's nothing to do with classical supergravity. It's just that when you start with the simplest ones, it looks something to be very close that's and very close confused. to classical. But you know, as you start going to more and more generic ones, it's just like packing more and more of these KK monopoles together. They become very quantum, very fluctuating. The main point is that in all these cases, as you go near the horizon, instead of getting the vacuum wave functional, it's the quantum statement. If you take the, any theory like 3 plus 1 quantum gravity, it doesn't matter what you do. If you perturb the horizon any way you like and you leave it, very soon it actually settles down so that the state near the horizon is the vacuum wave functional. And the point is when you take the limit through what you have gotten here, it is messy. There's some awful wave functional, but as you take the limit to more generic ones, you can see it's actually orthogonal to the vacuum wave functional and not the vacuum wave functional. So I'll say a little bit about it when I actually come to the uh, first balls. Yes, I had a question. Okay. So uh, regarding the question or statement of Lenny's uh, in the response, and also one. Uh, so my understanding is that it's more than just having the microstates. Uh, of the black hole and describing them as being at the horizon, you really concretely think of those as either variations in the geometry or uh, or uh, microstructure of the stringiness, the stringy yes. states, or or what have you. There, yes. There's a real thing that's yes. there. Yes, that's a real thing. It's not and, like and that's why there's at least a potential for concern that this looks very different than a black hole because Absolutely. if you have a highly yes. varying microstructure yes. hovering outside the horizon, it's something you can crash into and yes. would generically expect to be disrupted. And you should be heart. and you should be concerned. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so Absolutely. So I think yes, let me again summarize the thing I've said in response to these two or three questions here. The difference from the initial membrane paradigm is not that we have the usual black hole with a vacuum wave functional here, and we are putting an imaginary surface just outside and using it to get boundary conditions for appropriate purposes. This is real structure, real degrees of freedom. There is metric fluxes, strings, all kinds of quantum fluctuations. So it's not just geometry. You know, if you have two KK monopoles, you have you know two brain, two bar fluctuations between them and their centers when they are close enough. So I just drew every kind of mess in there. But yes. Thank you for saying that. This is actual structure. The wave functional does not continue past this region. It is very messy, and you should indeed be worried that you will crash into it and something will happen. That's what you're saying, and that's exactly right. That's exactly why this is the third iteration. And now I'm going to go to the fourth, which is why I have to, where I have to answer exactly your question. Will I crash into this? So exactly if I, so whenever we, because we had this first ball story going, when the uh, AMPS uh, story came out, everybody asked us, don't you agree that you will crash and burn? This is what you would also think, right? But in fact, we already had a fourth iteration to the story, which is also a conjecture. Okay, so that's a conjecture. But because of that conjecture, it's not obvious to me that hitting this first ball should be called crashing and burning. And that's what I want to show you uh, on the next slide. So, uh, if you compute local correlation functions, uh, when you say they agree with Hawking radiation, what is the parameter that controls the deviation of local right. correlations I, I away from the spot that's on, black hole so and on the next slide. I just, let me just talk on the next slide. So, so again, this is my first pass, so let me just uh, make this quickly and then go through everything in more detail. So what's the fourth iteration? If you have all the structure, you hit it and you smash, is there anything else to say? But uh, in fact, we were, we were wondering about that for quite a while, like what else can you say? But uh, 
the idea of ADS safety actually suggests that there is at least one more possibility. And let's see what the other possibility is. So you take the first ball, and it's just a surface. It might be a surface of a you know, liquid drop or something. And suppose you try to probe it by two probes. You stick to put two sticks in it and try to measure a two-point Green's function. Right? So of course, you can do an honest calculation where you know, this guy creates some ripples on this messy surface. You do the whole calculation detail. This guy picks it up. So you get some two-point Green's function. Now, wouldn't it be nice if instead of doing this awful uh, complicated calculation, you could get at least a good approximation, and the word approximation will be very important to me in a second, by doing a simpler calculation where I actually use the traditional black hole metric, which has actually also the interior completely smoothly uh, across the horizon where nothing is happening. And for example, if I'm doing a path integral of a scalar field, I go smoothly back and forth. I don't even know that there is anything here. Suppose it were true that these answers were approximately obtainable for these answers. Of course, the approximation depends on for what is it good and so on. And I try to say a little bit about it here. We have a whole file which I have here. If you want details, I'll to pull it up right on the screen and show you for what is it good and what is it not good. But suppose this were true. What would we say then? It, it turns out, suppose it turns out for a lot of things you do, like you stick to probes, you can get the Green's function by this complicated mess, and you can also get it by this calculation. Well, in a sense, it may be very difficult to see whether you actually have anything at the horizon. So just one second, let me just finish. So the I, point Excuse here was... Excuse me, Samir. Yes. Look, how is this different than just saying there are microstates at the horizon yes. and there's complementarity? It's not. This is what we call complementarity. We, we were trying yes, to get yes, your so complementarity. Is, we're right. trying to get complementarity. But how, how, I know, but what is different that you're saying that is different yes, than good. just... Uh, let me tell you. Yes. What we are doing is, if you want to realize complementarity, Okay, suppose you want to realize what you would have liked to get in 1993. Okay? If you actually have just 3 plus 1 canonically quantized gravity, I don't know how to do it. No, because do. Right, the right. quantum fluctuations at the horizon are only then Schwarzschild coordinates. They don't really do much for me. No, but we all agree that there has to be structures Good. which are the microstates of the black hole. We don't know what they are, but they've got to be there. That's what, what I need. What is, and that's the only new thing. What is that, new? That is the new thing. Uh, or all I'm telling you is that the first ball construction gets you structure at the horizon, after which all that you wanted can be updated. What is this construction? So this is the realization that microstates in string theory, they can actually have escaped the no-hair theorem where everything just gets sucked in and becomes a vacuum wave functional back. Because when you actually look at uh, microstates, they actually go and they have this capping off of the geometry. See, if you do not, suppose you give me a theory where you just, let's say, took away my compact directions or D-brains, if I cannot actually make uh, microstates like this, it's not possible to get structure. One might say, I think that the states are at the horizon, there is structure there, and they will radiate, radiate me back, and some other frame I'll fall in, and people will say, look, I don't see how. I just have one cross curve frame, those are the good coordinates, nothing happens. But it's nothing to do with coordinates. The actual states really end there, that's the real structure. So good. The first part of complementarity that you really wanted to have a stretched horizon is being realized in terms of real degrees of freedom. And that's coming out because the compact dimensions pinched off and made these monopoles on the surface. And now the second question to ask is, look at the behavior of this stretched horizon. If you hit it and perturb it, is the dynamic such that it can be reproduced by something to do with effective space time, which is smooth? The AMPS argument tries to put a wrench in that kind of thing. But in fact, when we had come to do this, as I said, we had found that there should be an approximation sign here. I'll be telling you why that sign should be there. And with that, I'll be showing you that, in fact, the AMPS argument is avoided. So as I said, AMPS asks for equal to an approximation. And this can't work. But uh, it's very interesting how it actually gets avoided. You really have to compute something when you actually uh, put this approximation in. And then in the end, it will go away. Sorry. So in the end, the picture will be, yeah. Uh, this qualitative level where one does not have the explicit geometries, right? C can't yeah. we also say that uh, have, let's say, some alternative construction where we say we take all Rindler, the Rindler quantized yes. uh, field theory, and we have all these modes, and I think of them as physical, and yes. they reproduce the black hole entropy. I I'll come and the talk modes about that. We can also, understand yes. very explicitly, have less than the black hole entropy. Right, the, the fluctuations okay. far from implied. But I'm, I'm going to assume and extrapolate that we. You mean some scalar field in Rindler? You mean? Well, no, no, just no, no, full the, say pure gravity. Okay, so okay. then okay. we have all the Rindler modes. Yes. We sum them all. We get say divergent answer in principle. Yes. And I say, well, that's the black hole entropy. Okay. And so this is uh, 
this I think is as good as the fa fastball construction because the, the states for which we can ha trust classical solutions would be, it's a small subset of the space, of, of the states, right? Okay, so I'm not completely sure I follow, but can we again come back to that question when I get to that level? Yeah. Sorry. Um, just about, about your point A here. Um, point A. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah I want to ask something specific. Okay. Um, so there are modes whose energy is of order the temperature, um, right. but which have high angular momentum, which are important for the infalling observer. Sure. So it, I think if you, so if you say that this approximation only works for modes whose energy is high compared to the temperature, then you've still got a problem. No, I can, yeah, yeah, so let me just Are you, you, you going to explain that? No, no, I think this is a, a mistake we shouldn't make here. One shouldn't say that it's only, there's no word only here. There are a lot of things in a thermodynamic system, which is, you know, with just, there are a lot of things which are just going to work for lots of reasons. All I want to finally come back and give you is some guys for which it will definitely work, because I have to go and apply it back to the AMPS argument of an observer who falls in freely from outside. Okay. okay. So for that guy, it's my job. Yeah, it's not that it's going to work only for that, right? There are many things it will work for. You take, give me an example of which one you want it for, and one should go check. Okay. So I don't know. I'll have to go and check, yeah. I haven't even quietly understood that. But I just want to say that it's not only if for anything. My job is only, uh, which in fact, what David would be doing is that if somebody is falling in freely from outside, we'll define what high energy means for a guy falling in freely. As the black hole becomes big and the guy falls in freely, at least then it should work. Otherwise, it's not very useful. No, and that's what so we compute for. Okay, good. So when we come to that, then we should look at it and it should work. Yeah, otherwise, there's a problem, indeed. So I, I thought of, or sorry, I might have thought a response to Juan and Lenny is that there's real structure there in the sense of, say, the following. Uh, for a typical microstate, you have a, uh, a very large curvature, a very large Riemann curvature, yes, you know, yes. say measured in local tetrad, whatever, uh, near the horizon, much larger than, say, the typical curvature yes. of the Schwarzschild solution. Yes. Is, is that a true statement? Yes, definitely. Okay. It's so, a blank so that's a yeah. real sense uh, in which yes. you have microstructure there, yes. structure at yeah, much I mean, shorter distances. I, I don't know if it helps, but I, yeah. Let me just make this comment. I was going to probably make it a little bit down the road anyway. Uh, from what I see at this point, there's nothing we have found different about three-charge extremal and three-charge near extremal, which is working out to be different from the case we had initially done for two-charge extremal solutions. Okay. So that story hasn't been completely worked out, but Binner, Warner, and Sigamorin all seem to be finding the same thing and we also seem to be finding the same thing. For, so let me just talk about what happens for two-charge extremal, because there everything is known. So whatever you want, at least I can give you an answer. And there, all the states are, in fact, of this kind. I can show you what it means. They have been quantized, and their number is correct. And the cutoffs come because of the natural quantum, quant when you quantize the automatic cutoffs. So it's not like there are infinite number of states or any pileup or anything. So you can, all the states are like this. You can write them in a family. You can quantize the family. You get the right number, and you know, and as far as we know, the three charge story seems to be working out the same way. Can I ask, so I don't have that much to tell you about three charge because it's a little more difficult. Can I ask a question about this? So, so one of the additional things that the first balls could give in principle is maybe a description of how far outside of the Schwarzschild radius you can start seeing deviations from right. classical general relativity, or at least from naive but, effective yes. field theory. Is there such a thing? That, yeah, I that think it's just order Planck scale. I can try to show it, you so, how we so get. So, if it's order, order Planck scale, yeah. then I, I tend to agree with the fact that this is this, then this is just a way of talking about microstates. Yeah, I think it's a way of talking about microstates. I think and the problem is that there's nothing. Yes, it's a way of talking. Yeah, yeah. You, the, so yeah, why don't we just go through that discussion first as to why one came? But, but, um, uh, yeah, then it's not obvious that you actually can add anything else than just uh, putting a, a stretch horizon. There. No, no, that's not true. Yeah, so let me actually uh, then make a comment. If people are curious about this, just go on. Okay. Um, you know, we should think of having an extent. Obviously, there are very good questions yeah. which we all want to ask. We should maybe think of having letting the discussion section run That's the good, discussion yeah. session okay. run longer after to get to this, and, and if necessary, push back the rest of the schedule. Okay. So That's we fine. can ask questions, but but. It would be okay. nice if you could. Okay, so let me just case. make a, one comment to that and maybe then not take any more questions at this point. And the comment was that there's one point missing in what, what you just said. And the whole point of the first ball construction is that you go through a new expansion parameter, which we didn't have before. So normally, if you just had gravity with you, you could only expand in the, you know, the metric, small amplitude, but this is a non-perturbative construction. OK? 
Okay? Or you could go to long wavelengths, and the generic status doesn't have long wavelengths. What happens is that you can now take all the microstates and arrange them in order of complexity. A simpler one, which I'll show you what it means. Then more difficult and more difficult and more difficult. So previously, people had no way to get here. You try to get here, you come back to the spherically symmetric solution. Now you take the simplest solution, you see, no, I have a way to get here. I get a KK monopole, anti-KK monopole, I have something. Take the next state, and you find I have four KK monopoles, but they are slightly smaller. Then I have eight, and then I have 16. And now you take the limit saying, where do I go to the generic state? And you find, OK, now, of course, they have to be Planck size because they have to fill up the whole horizon. You did not have this before because you did not have this way of getting to the states. So the whole point was, which I think really is very, very crucial to everything, you have to know if there's any way in your theory that you can get a real structure at the horizon so the vacuum, the wave functional at the horizon is not the vacuum. This is exactly equal to saying that if you were back in the early 70s and you found hair for angular momentum 1, 2, 3, 4, if you extrapolate to the cutoff of angular momentum, you would get all the right number of states. If that were true, you had hair, nobody would ever have worried about the information problem because the horizon has structure. But you didn't find the hair. All you need to know is what's the analog of L equals 1, 2, 3 states now? And that's what these guys are. Okay, so well, let me just move on from there because uh, I can't say that much more about it. Okay, so then, so the last, so what, what, if you don't have these first ball states, if you don't actually have a construction of hair in your theory, you will actually just get the vacuum at the horizon and you really cannot get anything. Okay, if you have vacuum at the horizon, you will not reflect information back. Okay, everything will just go in and the GR people will be exactly right. You go in and the entanglement keeps increasing. Okay, so these are the four steps and I think it's this last step which I think uh, I just want to emphasize here again that the way the empty space comes out is that you have this real structure there, but when you probe it with things and you make it wiggle and do things, can you get the Green's function out of something else? And you know, the arguments I use just go back to the old arguments of Israel, which uh, Madhusina used and Van Ramstrong developed. Those are just motivation, but this is the claim. This is the sense in which you would get it, and this and the previous one put together gave me a picture which I would like to call some kind of version of complementarity. Okay, so let's just go back and see what I was talking about a second ago. Why is it so hard to find hair? And I think this is one thing the string theorists have probably not focused on as much as they should because they just assume, okay, there'll be some structure that will do my job for me, but let's just pause for a minute to see why the GR people are so convinced that you know the black hole is unique and you get information loss or you know, remnants or whatever you want. And the reason is this. Okay, so if you look at the, uh, if this is the horizon, a null ray trying to escape out at the horizon sort of never managed to get out. If it's just outside and readily heading out, it ultimately goes out. If it's just inside, sort of, even if it's trying to go out at the speed of light, it actually falls in. So in fact, you see, horizon is sort of an unstable place. If you keep some kind of mode here, it stretches and stretches and just dilutes away. So it's like this space, it keeps expanding. So even if you put some structure there, it just dilutes away to the vacuum very fast and, you know, so if you really want to make something stand near the horizon, like take a rocket ship, you're going to have a very large amount of exhaust to get a lot of pressure. Some guys going this way, some guys going that way, and then you can just about barely stay at the horizon. And if you do the same thing, let's say for a field that shows up in the fact that if you try to find an eigen mode for any scale of field, let's say, then the pressure at the horizon sort of goes to infinity at the place where GTT goes to zero. And this is sort of a very basic problem. You can't just stick something at the horizon. And so when people said, just give me structure at the horizon, I assume there are states at the horizon, just show me any one way of getting it. You don't have to get me the generic state. You, whatever, you have to find me some way of getting hair, of getting structure. And if you get the hair and there are only few, like suppose you have an SU3 gauge theory and you can get Z3 hair. People have done that before. That doesn't help me, right? The hair should in principle extrapolate all the way. So in principle, they capture all the degrees of freedom. Obviously, you should have some way of under understanding the simplest one very explicitly first. Because if you already go directly to the generic one, you can never understand anything. It's all Planck scale and all a mess, so you haven't said anything. That's true. But the whole beauty here is there is a sequence. All the states of the CFT can be put one by one in a sequence, and I'll show you the sequence. And you start from the simplest, and all the states look like this. And because they all look like pinched KK monopoles, you extrapolate the sequence, and they're all in the sequence. The last one you can't make because it's a mess. It has nothing to do with anything. You've actually found that there can be structure in string theory, and you can see where it is coming from. Okay, so and so this is what I had already told you before. Things get pinched off. Let me just hurry through this. I already said this. Three charge extremal near extremal story seems to be working exactly like two charge. And in two charge, all the states are like this. They can be made and they can be quantized and they give exactly the right number. Okay, so one day, I don't know when that day is, the same might work for three charge extremal near 
extremal things. Some non-extremal ones are made, made JMART. Uh, from them, the Hawking duration was computed and found to be correct. I have to still show you exactly what it correct means. Uh, I'm just trying to make a certain family of neutral maximal Kerr states. We have a construction, but the paper is not out yet. So, okay, so all kinds of states can be made, but this is a, a slow game. And right now, we just assume it can work. So when we made these fuzzballs in the beginning, people were asking, some people were worried, maybe some states are like fuzzballs, but other states might be like traditional black holes, which had the vacuum at the horizon. Is that possible? Well, if the, you get a vacuum back at the horizon, then what about the Hawking argument? You'll again have the pair production, and you have a problem. So one thing you might worry about, OK, maybe you could have a vacuum at the horizon, but then you'll emit entangled pairs. You guys have must seen this uh, entanglement of you know, no particle here, no particle 0, 0, plus 1, 1 in several places by now. And the second step, you could say that even though you get 0, 0, plus 1, 1 for the next mode of emission, you could make a small correction, which depends on what happened at the previous step. Like if you emitted 0, 0, then the 0, 0 is enhanced a little bit by epsilon 1, and this is de-enhanced. If you produce 1, 1, then the 0, 0 could be enhanced by a different amount or de-enhanced, and this could be uh, made to go the opposite way. So in fact, after n steps, you would get 2 to the n correction things. So even the epsilon is small. This would still look like a normal place. It's almost 0, 0, plus 1, 1. So if this were true, it still looks like almost normal at each emission, but the number of steps uh, is so large, you might wonder, could you actually get at the end a state where all the guys at infinity are really unentangled from all the guys inside? A priori, that's not obvious, but that's what this uh, inequality actually proved using strong severity additivity can prove that even though the number n involved is very large, the entanglement actually keeps growing. If all the epsilons involved in that previous step, previous slide, are bounded by some constant epsilon, in fact, you always get an increase of log 2 minus at most to epsilon. Okay, so, so then actually you find that if any microstate in your theory really had the vacuum wave functional, you have a problem because you will have all these pair creations. There will always be some small quantum corrections which I don't know what to do about, but they can be there. If they do make the corrections like this, it doesn't really matter. I will have an entanglement problem, and in my string theory, because I didn't want to have that, I, uh, I, I should not have that. So we made this argument just to uh, convince ourselves and others that, in fact, it's not that you should think that some states are fuzzballs. All states should be obtained from the limit of this kind of KK monopole construction. Simplest ones look like that. Next ones look like that. Next ones look like that. As far as you can see, they are going like that. But when you get to the logical limit, somebody could say, when you get sufficiently far, it may change, and they may actually have the vacuum wave functional. Well, you'll be exactly back in the problem. So at least that's not what you should be expecting. Yes, sorry, sorry, just a quick clarification. Uh, does this allow for the fact that the C2 that's emitted, the partner of the second one, could have an overlap on C1? I mean, if you try to do this in a finite system where the size of the Hilbert space wasn't growing at every stage. Yeah, you mentioned you know, about those things to me. Right, could, I don't have anything to say about it right so now. So this doesn't account for the fact that this C2 might be a collective excitation of some, some finite system inside. It's no, not this, that this you... Is just, yeah, for this you should see how the theorem was done. It's based on how, what you expect for the evolution in a good slice. But anyway, I think the kind of thing that you're talking about might be the non-local effects, which I'll try to say something about later. No, even if you just have a quark gluon plasma, just some system which is where you know things are being emitted, something goes out, and there's a collective degree of freedom that imitates the particle going in. That's the C. So in that I don't case, understand that yet, so let me just not make a comment about it. Okay. So I've already written out what corrections I've handled, and so with these corrections that nothing happens is the theorem. Okay. If there's something else, then let me not say anything about it. Okay, so let me just come to the last step of this part of the discussion. So you, you can just say, OK, if all the microstates actually look like this, you go to string theory, try to find the energy eigenstates, and they all have this messy structure at the horizon, then uh, that may be true. But if you just take a, a shell and you let it collapse, doesn't just keep going through its horizon and you know, just go to the horizon. Why, why should it not just make a standard black hole which has the vacuum at the horizon? What changed? And the, was there a question? Yes, I'm wondering if this is the same. I'm wondering if this is the same as saying, if I start with a collection of bell pairs, it's a large correction to get to a scrambled state. Bell pairs to a scrambled um, state. I'm not connecting I, exactly to the question right Well, now. okay, then, I, then yeah. I shouldn't pursue it. Uh, maybe we can talk about it later. I'm not connecting to it immediately. You, you may be right. I just didn't understand quite what you said. So anyway, here I just want to make a small point that this shell, if it's collapsing, what does it have to do with these guys? Well, actually, there's always a small amplitude for any state to tunnel into any other state. And uh, okay, this is going to be very small. These are whole you know, solar-sized objects. But let's estimate it anyway. You can estimate from the Einstein action, and you get something. For all lengths, I just put gm, the Schwarzschild radius. 
and the amplitude will be very small, e to the minus whatever this quantity is. But the magic which happens for the black hole, which can happen for the black hole, is the number of states to which you can tunnel is actually very large because it's given by e to the s Bekenstein. And the Bekenstein entropy, of course, we know is abnormally large, much larger than for, a, for something like the sun. And you notice something interesting, that this factor can actually potentially cancel this factor. So then you get an interesting uh, guess as to what the physics would happen here. The smallness of the amplitude cancel the largeness of the degeneracy. And if that happens, you get the following kind of physics. You can make a toy model where if you put a particle in a box, this is the wave function in a box, it can leak out by tunneling into neighboring boxes, but the amplitude for leakage is very small, some small epsilon. But let the number of boxes be very large, like some 1 by epsilon. And then we worked out the dynamics of that in this paper. It's very simple. After time of order unity, the particle basically vanishes from here and becomes a linear combination of something in all these boxes. And I think that's what I would say if somebody asked me what happens to the collapsing shell. You can basically, uh, as a shell is collapsing, you can actually write the whole initial shell as a linear combination of eigenstates, evolve all the eigenstates. If you want to recast just tunneling, all that happens is this guy in a time which is short, we also estimate the time there, actually becomes a, a linear combination of these first balls. And those guys, as we said, emit from their surface. And now there is no information problem. Samir, so this can is I just all ask that this first to, picture actually told you. Can I just ask you to quantify that? How much shorter than the Hawking evaporation time in your best estimate current? OK, so this estimate only said got you a less than less than sign. And you can see, you know, there are various approximations they made in the way that this is less than this, less than this. So you can see what it does. And for this purpose, I just left it here because as long as it has less than, less than sign, I have no information problem because the entropy of Hawking radiation, as you know, is 30% more than the Bekenstein entropy. So, so that you didn't have a me. better estimate. So, this but point. in the paper we just did with David, we do have a better estimate where we said that if the black hole assumed to stabilize in scrambling time, then we actually give you some better numbers. Okay, so you can take a look at that. But it's not on my slides right now. Okay, so here's a summary of all that I was saying about this uh, first ball construction. And so there are just three things I have told you. There needs to be a non-trivial structure at the horizon for all microstates. Okay, and that's proved by this, uh, you know, that's exactly basically what Hawking told us if you want information to come out. And you, could, you might worry the small corrections could screw you up. But if you use a strong subadditivity, then you get the inequality which tells you, no, you must have non-trivial structure of order one. And the microstates with this kind of structure, how are you to, going to get them? Because first you have to find them. And the crucial thing is you have to first go and prove that you don't, again, in this string theory of ours, again, go back to the vacuum wave function at the horizon like you did every other time you tried something in any theory of gravity. And that, I think, is the really hard step. And that requires you to actually make this construction and then take the limit to the generic state. And then the final thing is a large measure of these states in this, if you're at a path integral, the classical action we just saw, and the measure give, comes from Bekenstein entropy. And in fact, these two become canceling quantities. And so you find that this thing, a black hole, is not as classical as you thought. If the measure of states is so large, uh, it's going to overwhelm the classical action. And the whole dynamics is actually very different. So OK, so uh, what question do we want to ask from this now? If the objects are going to look like this, if these are the microstates, I don't have an information problem. But now you can ask, if I actually hit this guy, is it going to behave like a firewall? Am I going to burn or am I not going to burn? Okay, does the fuzz ball behave like a firewall? So you know, our conference is called fuzz or fire. And I think that's a bit of a misnomer. It's not like, am I a fuzz ball, am I a firewall? You have to be a fuzz ball to solve the information problem. Once you solve the information problem, you can say, OK, now I know my, I don't have an entanglement problem. Now that I have this structure, does it behave like a firewall and I burn? And that's possible. Or is there some kind of complementarity and I don't burn? So now comes the question. So you can ask, is the fuzzball like a firewall, or does the fuzzball have some kind of complementarity? So this means the definition of fuzzball is whatever solves the information problem? No, there's an actual construction here, right? This is a construction. You can, you can say that. I mean, something you have to get structure. If you, want to, if you don't get structure, I think the mistake that's being made by a lot of uh, people is that they assume that they don't have to do anything at the horizon, whatever relatives knew was enough. And you can assume that, OK, information comes out. We don't care how. And now let's talk about what happens. I think that's not quite right. Because it's very the whole problem was it's very hard to get the information out. right? That's why the information paradox has been there for 30 years. Because every time you try to put any structure at the horizon, it doesn't stick there. So finally, when you have a construction which can stick it at the horizon, that we know only one way to do it right now. That's the first ball construction. If you have another construction, then we can compare. But the first ball wasn't like a guess construction. You actually take microstates and you see that at strong coupling, they become these guys. So you don't have a choice. You can say some other states might become something else, but I haven't seen that. 
So if you don't have the first ball, you can't solve the problem. But once you have the first ball, your information problem can be solved, and now you can ask at the next step, does it give you complementarity or does it not? So uh, this is the idea of first ball complementarity. It was initially put on this paper I had mentioned, but then I actually slightly tried to add things to it in later reviews. So if you're looking at it, please do look at all those things. Each one has a little bit more than the previous one. But it's based on earlier ideas, as I said, of Israel Maldison and Rand Armstrong. So there's nothing here that you haven't seen, let's say, in yesterday's talk. But the way I'm using it actually will be quite different. And uh, so let me just begin the story this way. We just go back to the Minkowski vacuum. And let's say for a scalar field, and you know we can write in terms of entangled right and left energy eigenstates. So this is left state, right state, let's say for a scalar field, and you can do that. So you can ask what are the regular states for gravity. If I just take this room, it's Minkowski space, I cut across the middle, and I try to make a regular decomposition, uh, shouldn't there be a singular decomposition for gravity, and what are those guys? Well, those guys must have certain properties. On the right wedge, these guys, whatever states there are, they should live only on the right wedge. And the states on the left, they should try to live only on the left wedge. Right. And if you're looking for a scalar field, that's a little messy because I don't need to put a cutoff by hand and you get a negative energy spike there and so on. But for gravity, actually, we find that all the properties required in the Rindler states are exactly the properties you find from the first balls. They actually naturally come and end just before the horizon. They're pinched off. There's nothing to even continue. It's so, like a manifold. It sort of ends there. So they naturally end on this side. Their number, which you expect to be the, giving you the vacation entropy, it's just, is right for, to give, if you wanted the area of the, uh, even the Rinder entropy to be given by the area of the horizon, the number is sort of right. So I would get Minkowski space by taking the eternal black hole and making it big. And you know, in, that, in that case, whatever was being said for, uh, the, the black hole can also be said for Rindler. And so then what's the meaning of this e equation, which uh, you know, Van Ramsdong writes down and, uh, in his papers? And the meaning is very interesting. If you actually take let's say this room, and you want to cut it across the middle. There's no gravity here. It's pretty flat here. But you cut it across the middle, and you want to make a complete sum of states, which actually gives you back the vacuum, just like you got the Minkowski vacuum out of these messy states. In a scalar field case, these were just complicated Bessel functions, and we knew that. Here, of course, gravity is very nonlinear. If you ask, what are those states? I would say those are what the first ball states are. So first ball states make a complete sense, a set of states for the resolution of the identity in gravity. It's just a way of, it's just words. I'm not doing a calculation to tell you anything. But if I just want to think about what it's telling me, if I take any vacuum uh, in any system, even a CFT system, you can uh, field theory something, you can cut across any place and insert a complete set of states. You know, bra n, get n, sum over n. It's equal to the identity. It's a sort of a similar game, not exactly because you have all these four wedges, and we heard a lot about that yesterday from in, in Rand, Van Ramsdong talk and so on. But in whatever sense, this was a breakup here. Uh, the first ball seemed to give the partition of the identity uh, for gravity. It's just words being put on. Uh, because the point was, if I didn't have first balls, the states didn't actually end here in some way. If these were just black hole states, most of the states at mass m are black hole states, which have a horizon. If those were most of my states, I wouldn't be able to understand this decomposition. Because here I need guys who sort of live here. Here I need guys which live here. If this guy has a horizon which continues, and this guy has a horizon which continues, I was a little confused. But if the actual matrix actually all end there because the, it just caps off like this, well, then the whole picture at least made good sense. So anyway, let's assume this is true for the moment and see where it takes us. And the calculation I want to show you is just these two lines. Everything I want to tell you is just these two lines. And again, there's nothing very deep about this because in a way, you all knew this before. If you want an expectation value in the right wedge of an operator, OR, R just stands for right wedge, expectation value in the Minkowski space, then because this OM was written as E left times E right, you just get this, and you get a thermal average over all the right states. So this is a well-known fact. If an operator on the right edge can be on the right side in the Minkowski vacuum, is a thermal average over right Rindler wedge states. Well, the second statement also is uh, completely known to us. If you take the expectation value of OR in one of these right wedge states, EK, just one K, for a generic state, an appropriate operator, we'll have to see in a second what appropriate means, but this is just ordinary thermodynamics. So I'm not saying anything new to you. You can replace the uh, uh, expression value in one state by an ensemble average. It's just statmec, and you know it's not easy to say in statmec for which states you get a good replacement of microcanonical of a microcanonical ensemble to a canonical ensemble. But we know that it is there in general. And just look at those operators for which you can actually do this. But suppose for the, for those operators and those generic states for which this uh, you can replace the expression value in the state by the ensemble average. But this guy, of course, we have just seen is equal to the Minkowski guy. So if I have one guy, it's approximately equal to the ensemble average. So now you put this equation, this equation together, 
And of course, you get that if you measure the exponential of this guy in one state, with this approximation sign, it's equal to measuring it in this entire diagram. Again, I'm not telling you anything which isn't implicitly there in all these papers of uh, Israel, Monson, or Van Damme. So I'm just putting this story out, putting it in the first world context. So let's just call this a kind of complement entity we are actually looking for. This is picture one. In picture one, the operator, what would the operator do if I put something to measure there or do something there? It excites all this mess here and you know, does a, is a very complicated calculation to do where I you know, insert the operator, it excites all the degrees of freedom, I look at the state, and I compute some number. On this, uh, in, on, in picture two, where I have this uh, thing, there's nothing there. So if I'm trying to compute something, I just do a path integral of whatever's coming out from there, but the paths go freely back and forth across this horizon, and there's, not, there's nothing even there, right? You just go in a, all, the, all around, and so of course they go freely back and forth across the horizon. And so a calculation in a very messy state which doesn't have anything on the other side is reproduced to a good approximation, approximation by something which is actually uh, has both sides of the horizon, but no structure. So it's a very simple observation. Let me not say anything deep about this which other people haven't told us, but this is the observation. And I think this observation is what I would like to then take away from this story. Because now you can say a lot of interesting things about this. Because suppose, OK, I'm just drawing the same picture again. In this picture, which gave us the approximate answer, I'm calling the auxiliary picture, picture two. Here, of course, the B prime and C prime are correctly entangled and so on. And I should try to make connection to the AMPS argument. I'm just down to the last five or ten minutes. So let me try to now get back, make contact with the AMPS argument. So in, in AMPS also, there was a picture one and picture two. Picture two would be the complementary picture, and picture one would be the real picture with the, you know, some maybe a stretched horizon or something. But uh, let's not trace back where, where things went different. So of course, they didn't actually worry about anything like E much bigger than KT. There was no approximation scheme. You just want everything to work. But let's see where that comes in. So let's start with a black hole. And let's say it's gone through half its evaporation, trying to follow as uh, you know, the steps which are involved in the recent debate. And it's maximally entangled after some time. And it has S, S of M states. And they're maximally entangled with radiation at infinity. M is the current mass. Okay. And now you throw in some object. And now I do want to be careful if the, of the, that the energy I'm throwing in is much bigger than KT. And now there are going to be e to the s of this new mass in there, of new, this many states of the whole. And so this number of states I have after this guy falls in, divided by the number of states I had before the guy falls in, you can just see is e to the delta s. But delta s, is, you know, TDE is delta s, so it's e over kt. And it's much bigger than 1. Okay. So once you actually fall onto the fuzzball surface, then most of the states that you actually have in the system are new states. And they're not entangled with anything, because the entanglement was already generated before. You just fell in now. It will take a long time for the entanglement to grow. It's one by one at every Hawking quantum. And right now, you are in a situation where the black hole looks young again. So when you throw something of energy E much bigger than KT onto the black hole, once you reach the first ball surface at least, you're in a situation where all the states of the black hole are mostly the young states. This is an exponential in here. So if E by KT was 10, you have an E to the 10 factor. Most of the states are actually young. And what complementarity is, is the dynamics of these newly created degrees of freedom. I'll just be more precise about that in a second, just in terms of pictures. And say that this dynamics is what is captured by the physics of the black hole interior. Okay. So be, I'll, I'll just say a few, say this in a couple of different ways, and maybe it'll become a little clearer. So of course, AMPS worry about experiments with Hawking modes, B and C. The whole AMPS thing was very much focused on BC modes. But these have uh, E of the order of KT. What is the order of KT? We'll have to see in more detail, maybe in David Turton's talk. But that's where the whole difference is going to come. When something heavy falls in, most of the states are new. Okay, but that, that isn't enough. If you're going to fall and get new states, and these states are not entangled, you can say, okay, the argument is gone. But you know, we had nice email exchanges with uh, Joe and Don over the last year. They were very patient with their time. And their main worry was you could get burnt by the quanta coming out before you hit the first ball surface and access these new degrees of freedom. Then it wouldn't help you, because if you've already gotten burnt, then when you hit the surface, you can create new degrees of freedom, but they won't faithfully give you what you were. I mean, they can do something, but they won't, can't possibly be a faithful map of what you were. But here's the part where I, we think that uh, the AMPS argument uh, needs to be altered. They assume that the stretched horizon does not react, or does not deform, or nothing happens to it, before it's actually hit by what falls in. But when we look at how this uh, fuzzball surface behaves, which is a stretched horizon now, we actually find that before the guy hits it, the stretched horizon actually moves out. And that actually made the whole difference, because when this guy moves out, you can actually estimate how much burn, how close you need to be before you get burnt at E much bigger than KT. It depends on E, depends on T. It depends on E by T. Okay. And then you can see, if you have a given energy E coming in, you can figure out how far out you go. 
Okay. And you find that you, you always go uh, such a distance out that you don't get burned before you actually access the new degrees of freedom. If you, have, you have a protection by a factor of e over kt to the power, some power, 1 over 2 times d minus 2. And so as e becomes much bigger than t, suppose e is 100 t, well, that's your protection. Anyway, we said it's an approximate. Just one second. There was first a question here. Okay. There was first, I think, uh, Eric was asking. Uh, well, you say the, the surface moves out, but to me, you already indicated that there were many places where I can create a first ball surface, namely even here in the room. Good. So I would say this is a different first, first ball surface, and you sort of put it everywhere where you would like to have it. So the actual surface. Good, good. So there are many surfaces here, no, and actually, yeah. so there's nothing special about the horizon. Good. So at least I understand the question. So let me try to make some brief response. It will be brief because I should just try to finish, and then we should go. Yeah. So the point is, if I try to put in the middle of the whole difference between being in the middle of the room and being what I'm calling the actual first ball surface, there is a difference. Being in the middle of this room, I have a complete sum of things which are directly entangled. And if I sum them, we've agreed that there is, is the vacuum, which is the decomposition, right? If I had just one state, which is what the black hole in the sky is doing, if I had just one state, that's what I'm right now calling the fuzzball surface. It's true I can go to some other place and write a complete sum, but right now that doesn't help me. Because my real problems are that this particular one surface, uh, it has a particular state, and it has a particular radiation of certain B modes coming out, and they are very specific to the state. And if I come and hit a B mode which pointing spin up, as opposed to one which is pointing spin down, different things will happen. How can that have a complete... Okay, so those are the issues, right? So, okay. so anyway, some, let me just... See. Yes. Good. Are you saying that if uh, your postdoc David goes and jumps into the black hole instead of our Milky Way, the Sagittarius A star, he's clearly you know, e much bigger than e in some sense. Yeah, I would think so. Hole. He should be okay, yeah. And if he does that in our universe with standard model interactions, are you saying that this mechanism protects him from dying at the horizon? Yeah, so you said about standard model interactions. So I think now you're talking about the numbers. We were, we were discussing over email that this would work for e bigger than t and m much bigger than m Planck, where m is the mass of the black hole, right? Good. Yeah. Let me tell everybody what the question is because I had an email discussion with, with Don over it. And in the end, Don did agree that this thing bypasses the AMPS argument, except what he was asking was. <laughs> okay. I thought you said. Okay. I thought you said that. Yeah. Okay. I have the emails if you want to see. But let me just. But his question was this. In the end, the question he was asking was, in our given universe, you have certain values for the parameters like the value of the electric charge and so on. For these values. How big does the black hole have to be? See, this is all done in the limit of the black hole is much bigger than M Planck. We always write M much, much bigger than M Planck. Yeah, and E much bigger than 100 T. And uh, so is there like, suppose the electron charge is, you know, there's a lot of hierarchy in the hierarchy in the standard model. So suppose the hierarchy of factor of 10 to the 40. Could it be that unless the mass of the black hole becomes 10 to the 40 M Planck, the story I'm giving doesn't set in? OK, so that's in principle possible. I did try to check it out after our discussions, and I didn't find that to be the case. But maybe we can argue that privately. Yes. But right now, I'm not talking about that. You just assume M is much bigger than M Planck for the moment. So, and you're saying, but if, all I would ask you is, but if, I, if the sector X black hole was in principle made uh, 10 to the 100 bigger, then he wouldn't. Is that what you're saying right now? Because you're talking about the numbers, right? Okay, that's all. That's all. I'm, so the, I'm not talking about the numbers here. <laughs> okay, I'm not sure. I understand all those. Let me just summarize what I said. Let me just make the statement which I think is true, and then we should maybe just keep it for discussion. Let's see, let's see if we agreed on this, because I thought we did settle on this. If the mass of the black hole is sufficiently big, not the solar mass or any given mass in the astrophysical thing, if it's sufficiently big to clear all the hierarchy scales we have in the standard model, whatever number that comes to. The rest of us have no idea what this yeah, is. Yeah, let me just try to give the, okay, let me just try to summarize the discussion in line which we had over email. The point was, whatever we said here shows that the AMPS argument will be bypassed 
for E much bigger than T and M much bigger than M Planck. Okay? To me, those are just obvious assumptions. Uh, e much bigger than T is part of the discussion. M much bigger than M Planck defines a good hole for me. And then Don was asking, how much bigger does M have to be compared to M Planck? Because the standard model has very fine tuning factors in it, like 10 to the 40, could it be that M much bigger than M Planck is not 10 M Planck, but maybe 10 to the 40 M Planck? I don't think it's relevant to the abstract discussion, so let me just move on. But we were debating whether it could be a number as big as 10 to the 40. Before the universal physics I'm talking about actually sets in. Uh, I don't think it's, I think it's a fixed number, and so I don't think it's relevant. Mm -hmm. Not in this problem. Okay. I just have a few slides left. Can I just finish the slides actually, and move on? Yeah. I'd like to, I mean, I only heard the second order from Don, and I'd, I'd t my understanding is one, one, one issue was that there was a claim that a photon of sufficiently high energy would pass through David's body. Is that part of the argument? Is it part of the argument? I know yeah, you're, saying, you're saying that the interaction cross-section is too small, which is my, inter my, my second interpretation was, again, that this means that high energy photons would pass through David's body. He couldn't okay. see them. Is that right? We certainly did the cross sections for gravitons, photons, and scalar fields. I, I don't know what else I would say. They say, they say they, they we they, did the interaction cross sections for gravitons, photons, and scalar fields. And you're saying, yes. and in all those cases, whatever you write down as a curve, suppose you say the cross section has a certain c number, okay? Some, yes, yes. some number times something. Yes. Some fixed number, the strength of your cross section, and then it grows with energy in, in the way that photons right. grow or gravitons grow, right? Then as you start making m much bigger than m Planck, at some point, the same physics comes right back to you. Wait, wait. A, a fo your body will stop a photon of any energy, no matter how large. Okay. Does that matter? I mean, I guess I don't understand what I, is that. What does it mean the cross section okay, is too small? Thing. Yeah. Can we just look at uh, David's talk, which will actually give you the, the calculation because the calculation. Okay. Okay. Here. Then if it's going to appear later, then let's, let's wait. I just want to summarize what, what we found here, and then you can look yeah. ask the question for you know each each field one by one. So anyway, so this is basically what happened. And so this is the, the key point, I guess, which where I would like to uh, say something about the AMS discussion. So the Hawking quantum B don't burn the infalling guy before the stretch horizon actually moves out and access the new degrees of freedom. And the complementarity the dynamics of these new degrees of freedom. So here's my picture of how the complementarity works. You have this fuzz ball surface, which has these KK monopoles on the surface or whatever. And depends on what they're doing, depends on which microstate it is. Somebody comes and falls on it. This guy is E much bigger than T, it creates like a huge number of new KK monopole pairs. If E is of the order of T, you'll create only one guy. You know, there's nothing thermodynamic about that guy. So you create this whole blob, and then the blob sort of disperses. It's very much like the story of ADS-CFT, because there, for example, in one description, if I have some D brains over here, I go and I hit them, I just become gluons which are going here and there, and you might say, I'm dead. But on the other hand, it's not just any dispersion of gluons that's going on. It's a very specific state of gluons which is spreading over there. And this particular delicate way of spreading is such there's a complementary description where you can say, hey, I just go smoothly into an ADS. Yes. And the claim is that if you add at sufficiently high energies, the new number of guys you create, the new degrees of freedom, NF, is much more than the uh, NI which were in there. And the dynamics of these new guys is relatively insensitive to the exact details of what you had before you came in. And this dynamics, therefore, gives you the same approximation, E much bigger than KT, the approximate complementarity that we were so, looking for. Sorry, Samir, Samir, just one question. Can, Go ahead. Sorry. Um, can I just ask, if, if you had one of these Rindler wedge fuzzballs? Yes. Um, Rindler wedge fuzzballs. Uh, yeah, yes, some that, that, you were, that you were talking about. Just, just one of the... Just one, one side. One okay. of the states. One state, uh, okay. I mean, would you, would you be saying here that you, you could literally just keep going forever if... I, I mean, now my... Yes, you could feel... In a generic state, you would feel that you're going on for a long time, absolutely. Forever? Or so, so, I mean, in Rindler, I guess you're... It depends if you're giving me how generic a state. If you give me a completely generic state, I would say forever. Uh -huh. okay. Let, let's do that in a second. I'm just down to my last two slides. Let me just wrap up, and then let's come back to everything. Okay, just one, one clarification yeah. about wh why are we restricting to E larger than T? I thought at the beginning you said if you're looking at low-point correlators, as long as the number of insertions doesn't scale with the entropy, even for low energies, yeah, but it, it also works out. So it this question about out. SPC is a question about a two-point function. You know, somebody measures the number occupancy of some mode which has energy much less than the temperature, and somebody on the other side measures the same occupancy, and they should get the same result. And they do. So, so two-point functions work always work out. Not right? only for 
be larger that. than T even for E smaller than T. But everything yeah. you're saying here is it's something fine. which is true only for observers. Because I have a particular question in mind. If somebody falls into the black hole, I'm trying to answer the AMPS question right now. But uh, so he measures the two-point function of of an operator of of energy less than yeah. T. Is that, that also the out. same? I think that will work out. So so, so two-point functions for operators. There's so I think that's not a good e test of anything. Anyway. Yeah, I think the two-point function is not a good test of anything. Anyway, can, can I just finish my last two slides here because I'm you know exactly back to the time where I had started almost maybe just a couple of minutes. So the point is, does the stretched horizon have to move out? Because that's the point where the AMPS argument actually faltered. And that we should have probably expected on abstract grounds. Not we, Of course, we did a calculation. The first of all, we saw it tunnel out and so on. And David will describe that a little bit to you. But even on abstract grounds, if you look at what a stretched horizon does. So if, this is my cartoon of a stretched horizon. You can have you know n bits, uh, pl plackets of uh, area Planck length squared. And so you have e to the s states. And you know, each one has a spin up and down, so you have two to the n states, and that's the entire number of states for the black hole. And now suppose some new bit comes and falls on it. Suppose it could just fall on the stretched horizon without expanding the stretched horizon. Just think about it for a second, it's a little funny. Because now you have more than e to the s states on the same area. Now for a normal surface, that's fine. On this surface, without expanding it first, I can throw another atom. And then later the surface may stretch or shrink or do whatever it wants. But that's because on this surface, there's nothing special. There can be gaps between the atoms. I can go into the gap. But a stretch horizon is actually something a little different. It already is maximally packed with these plackets. So I think there's something a little funny. If you can add another uh, bit to it and have more than 2 to the n states, 2 to the n plus 1 states in the same area, what we seem to find here is that as this guy comes close, it actually stretches out and actually uh, Horizon opens up to a larger area and absorbs the guy in. So even though we actually had to see this, uh, you know, where to work out how much it does and the fact that saves you and bypasses the AMPS argument, the AMPS argument assumed that you first hit the stretched horizon and then, uh, if, if then if it wants to expand, it can expand. But I think that's not true. So it's, there's nothing technically wrong with the AMPS argument, but one of the assumptions was the stretched horizon doesn't move out before it's actually hit. And what I'm trying to argue is, with first boss, that doesn't seem to be the case because the tunneling mechanism I gave you actually shows that as you come close, the horizon tunnels out before to, to meet you. And what also on the abstract grounds of what your stretched horizon should be, or what I thought it should do, I think it's reasonable that it comes out and meets you. And then when you do the numbers of how far it comes out, that's the kind of thing that David would talk about. That's in our June paper. You find that the AMPS argument is actually bypassed. So actually, I'm out of time. So maybe I won't talk about this if somebody doesn't have a question. Let me just go back to my summary slide so I can just tell you in a nutshell everything I've said. And then if you have time, you can ask questions. Or maybe only over the discussion. So this is a summary of everything I have told you. Hawking told us if there's no structure of the horizon and physics is assumed to be local and good slices, we have an entanglement problem. Okay. So if the, is the Hawking argument rigorous? You could ask, is there a problem with the argument? And it is indeed stable to small corrections. That's the inequality we had there. So you need, if you ask, should there be structure at the horizon? Yes, you need non-trivial structure at the horizon to solve the entanglement problem. Okay. So this is already old. As I was emphasizing a couple of days ago, some people confuse the AMPS argument with the statement that if you want to remove the entanglement problem, you must have structure at the horizon. Okay. No, that is not new. This is what was actually already there. This is, in fact, the uh, a, a theorem which I had in this paper. Okay. Now the next question was, how can you actually get this structure? If you don't have the structure, the whole question is moot. You'll simply have information loss. Well, then, you have, because there's a no-head theorem, you don't seem to get the structure. But in string theory, the first ball construction appears to give you the set of states. And let's assume they are all of this kind, at least for the purpose of our AMPS kind of discussion. Then the next question you should ask is, is this guy going to behave like a firewall and burn you? Or is it there going to be some kind of complementarity? But we already knew you can only have approximate complementarity, because since the structure is a manifest different, different things for different states, Okay. You can't replace them all by the vacuum, because you, two different things behave a little differently. They can't both go back to the vacuum, so it can only be an approximation. Well, the approximation you have to see what you're doing for the given process. And as David would show you, there's a lot of things to check. Something going with some energy, you know, or E over T, this ratio E over T comes in everything. Right? And then you find, indeed, uh, there are many things which agree and many things which don't agree. But right now, there's only one issue of uh, focus for the AMPS argument. You take something which falls in freely from a distance which is uh, order m or larger outside the horizon. Right? If you fall in freely from, let's say, 3m down through, you see how much energy you have when you hit the horizon. At that point, you ask if the guy is actually going to be such that all these approximations work, and the guy will behave like this to a good approximation. 
And yes, you have protection by a factor of e over t uh, to the power 1 over 2 times t minus 2. So it is indeed a good approximation. And so what exact line in the AMPS argument broke? It was the assumption the stretch horizon does not move out before it is actually hit. Okay, so I think that's a summary of uh, what I wanted to say here. Uh, Samir, just a, a clarification. Uh, are, are you asserting that, independently of whether you get burnt or not, are you asserting that a sufficiently careful infalling observer who's much smaller than the black hole it falls into uh, could detect the event horizon with an experiment locally? Uh, let me see if I understand the question. A sufficiently small observer, like I'm basically asking a question related to my, you know, claim that the only thing that's at stake here is the equivalence principle. In other words, as far as the as far as this infalling observer is concerned, is the equivalence principle violated or not? Can you can you locally detect with a sufficiently careful experiment that you're Good. crossing Good. an event horizon? I, I should say something about that. The, the sufficiently careful, uh, when you see the calculation which is actually involved here, brings in one step crucially. If you lower the guy gently to the horizon by fine-tuning it by an amount which is proportional to the radius, like suppose you drop him from 2.3 m, he will not see anything. If you drop him from uh, 2 m plus 10 l Planck, he will. Okay. So it, if you drop, if you f hover there. So for there, example, if I just hover near the event that's horizon. Right. We have a whole I, section about what you do when you hover. It'll be different from, from being accelerated right. in some other that's place. That's right. That's right. Because when you hover, you can, you're actually sitting at the local Hawking temperature. If you sit at the local Hawking temperature, you're going to pick Hawking modes. As you see, this whole thing came only out of the thermodynamic approximation at some place, right? You saw the inequality. Thank you. So anytime you actually try to catch a Hawking mode, you will see a difference. When you fall freely in, you create so many new guys. Those guys are swarm everything which, over what was there, and you don't see the difference. There's not that much more to the story. There was a question here. Okay. The idea that the horizon moves out is well known. Everybody knew that in this yes. business. When something falls in, indeed, it moves the horizon out a little bit. Yes. That's absolutely standard. Yes. The question was not whether you get killed at the horizon. It's whether you got killed at the apparent horizon. I understand. Yes. I don't see how your story addresses that. I'm not saying your story is wrong. I'm simply saying how did your story address yeah, that? I'll tell question. you where the difference came in. Yeah. So as you say, we all know that the horizon moves out first, right? Because even when you make a black hole by collapse, the horizon starts forming even before the guys come anywhere close. Right? Somehow that itself, uh, if, if I only use that, actually it would be very easy for me to bypass the AMPS argument. There's an old paper which uh, Don Morrow sent me of Morrow and collaborators, which actually shows that uh, this, uh, the amount by which the horizon moves out, if a point particle is coming here, it's actually a spike going all the way here and back, yes. right? So, all that, right? But the point is, what I need to know is a little more. The horizon is just an apparent, I mean, it's just a place, right, which you get by doing something to the metric. I don't, I'm more concerned about where are the actual degrees of freedom which I can hit, which uh, I will interact with, which can burn me. I need to know what all the quantas are doing. Where is the first ball? Where are the quanta emitted? What energy do they have? And where have they gone? Keeping track of all that, I need to deal with the actual first ball surface. And that comes in the following place. Wherever the first ball surface itself has gone, once I hit the first ball surface, that impact allows me to ex get a large number of new states, which will actually give me whose uh, outflow and sub subsequent evolution is actually going to give me the complementary description. So what I need is I don't actually get burnt before actually hitting the KK monopoles, which will allow me to access these new NF states which I had. So where are the NF states? For that, you have to go back and see where is the first ball surface and the actual surface of these monopoles, not an imaginary line which I would draw somewhere. Where, how far does that go out? For that, what you have to do is you have to look back at this tunneling mechanism and the tunneling time. Because if I just put two particles here, we have just said, you know, the KK monopoles tunnel out at this place in this much uh, whatever time. And you have to see the actual KK monopoles which you're going to hit on the surface to access the new degrees of freedom, how far have they gone? And so when you do all that, you find, yes, the stretched horizon is actually keeping track of uh, where the actual degrees of freedom are, and the amount by which that has moved out is actually enough. I didn't just use a formal uh, horizon location move out because then I wouldn't have known there's anything there. If I go to that place, I don't know, I don't know that I'm accessing a huge NF, much bigger than NI degrees of freedom. So there's a little more to the calculation than just, uh, just drawing a horizon. 
which whatever David's going to do in his the one in our, in our papers, the paper from June. Samir? Yes. The thermal ensemble uh, that you were talking about with the Rindler uh, horizon, I, I think you were saying that each microstate gives, you know, typical result. I mean, not each and every, yeah. but uh, yeah, back uh, there. But I mean, each of these energy eigenstates should be singular on the horizon. I mean, if you look at something like stress energy, you know, some of these will have divergently negative stress energies, some of them will have divergently positive stress energies, but they'll, they'll all be singular. So in, in what sense Good. Yeah, let me each of these words. states? Yeah. So I think if you had just taken, let's say, a scalar field on a flat space, that's exactly what happens, right? I was talking about you have to put a cutoff, you get this negative energy spike, and you know, all those problems are there. But I think what has happened with gravity is a little better. Because when we came here, as I said, there's something better about the first ball thing. If you look at these states, they actually come and the manifold actually ends uh, before the horizon is actually reached. So these are self-closing manifolds. These are manifolds which far away are whatever they were, flat space. But as you come close, they've actually just capped off to smooth manifolds. By smooth meaning they're very quantum and they're fluctuating. But the natural Planck scale fluctuations which regulate everything actually cut off that particular divergence. So I think there is no divergence. Cut off at the Planck scale. At the Planck scale. Absolutely. Right, but, as, but as you're approaching the Planck scale, they're diverging, whereas the, the thermal state, nothing is diverging. Okay, let me see if I understand. Yes, yes, so in that sense, everything might go as an expectation value will shoot up to Planck scale in a given microstate, but if you sum it over, it will not. Right. That's what you're asking. And yeah, I think but I thought you were arguing that in a typical microstate, you would get the same type of phenomena as in the thermal ensemble. Yes, which yes. So, the, so uh, let me see if I understand the question. So I think for, you have to maybe first tell me if the operator you have is of the kind which satisfies this approximation. Because if the operator, let's say, probes a certain region, I slightly smear my operator, it might satisfy this. If I don't smear it, it probably won't. Because if I measure only but something I mean, at one I point. Take, take the stress energy operator near the you know, a few Planck lengths outside the horizon smeared over a few I think that Planck scales. I think that will probably work. For, I think that will probably do this, and then I would expect this to work. But maybe we can talk about it. I don't have that much to say about it on the face. So I'll see the operator and see what I have to say. Actually, a, well, a quick response to Bob. It's, a, it's actually slightly better than what you say in the following sense. If you look at these states, uh, then you have a pairing, say, between zero inside, zero outside, one inside, one outside, et cetera. And in those paired states, there's actually a cancellation. You have a positive stress uh, outside, uh, and if you try to scatter off of it, there's a uh, negative stress just inside, and there's a cancellation between the scattering amplitudes. So it's actually a little bit better than you might naively believe, although I don't think it's sufficient to you know, resolve these problems, and in particular, I think to encode the information, you probably need analogs of the zero, one states, and so on and so forth. Um, so just a quick response there. A question, the Samir, and problem. that is, uh, just briefly, could you say what you have to say about the uh, writing local effects non-locally? OK. Yes, I think uh, this is my way to try to connect to the way uh, maybe Maldusina was thinking about this, and uh, maybe uh, in this recent kind of thing also maybe, and the way you think about it. So we're basically the point has been this, right? Now that we've actually got the structure at the horizon, and again, let me emphasize, that's the main step. You can't just assume the structure. You must first find it, otherwise you can't do anything. Once you have the structure, then we were asking if you can get certain questions to be approximated by this. Now, for me, this was the exact answer, right? And this is an approximate answer obtained by some auxiliary system. So you can ask a question, can you instead start on this side and try to add some corrections to the auxiliary picture to get back the full answer. You could ask that question, right? And let's see what happens if you try to do that. So then in a small patch, if you try to see how the approximation works, because e, it works for E much bigger than T, I'm just being very rough here, it works on ball sizes where L is much less in the radius of the black hole. So in a small ball like this, this approximation has worked well. You can approximate the smooth by the full geometry of the first ball here. You can take a different ball and also make the approximation as long as L is much less than M. But if you try to make a bigger ball by overlapping the two, it doesn't work, right? Because if I could, if you could replace by the smooth metric over a size of order m, you again have the pair creation entanglement problem. It doesn't work. So the approximation you are getting by this, where you can replace 
this uh, thing by the smooth geometry, this is uh, what were you doing? Well, it only works in patches with L much less than M. But when you try to join the patches together, because they don't completely smoothly join to make good physics in a full patch, you can recast the mismatch of physics which you have, which prevents you joining into one patch, as some kind of non-local effect. Because now it looks like a low energy effect, so you're preventing the joining of these two patches together. And if the mismatch can be cast a gentle low energy effect, it looks very non-local, depends on a large part of the state and so on. And I was just wondering if the, when you, you come at it from the non-local side, or maybe when Juan says, you know, gentle non-local effects might encode everything ultimately, it is probably equivalent to, you know, uh, I was still, if you want me to do the whole thing in a computer, I would still have to do this. But I could try to recast it by starting on this side and putting corrections to come back here, and then they look like a sequence of very gentle corrections, but of course very, very complicated, right, and state dependent. But then if there is a good approximation where this looks like this in some approximation, you can always start on this side and try to go back. And I think whenever I see people talking non-local effects, I was saying, look, look, I don't want to hear about them. But I think that's not quite right. Because of the other way to go around, maybe that's the way I should think of the non-local effects, and then both, both methods would converge. I still think this is much cleaner for trying to understand questions like the AMPS question. But I think it may be possible to recast, in principle at least, in non-local language, though there I may not be able to answer the AMPS questions in that language. Okay, that's all I had to say about it, really. Yes, there's another question. Make this approximation a little more precise. Let's say I look at a correlation function of some local field, uh, which has much less than s points. It doesn't it, it's a five point or ten point correlation function, and there's a typical length scale x. So when you say these correlators are approximately the same as the black hole, I mean, what controls the, appro the approximation? Is it power law and x by l Planck, or x by l string, or is it e to the minus x by l Planck? Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. I'll have to take a look at your particular quarter and sit over it. I don't know how much. Oh, but isn't that an important question about what is it that controls the deviation of local correlators in these fuzzball geometries away from the black hole? I mean, what is the parameter if it's, I think it's exponential? Okay, I haven't found it to be important for anything which I was doing here, at least for the AMPs, but because certainly ask the question, we can try to discuss it. For the AMPs thing, I had a given process, like a guy's falling in freely from 3M. For that, I did all the estimates and what the errors were. That's what the whole paper is about, 50 pages. You can see the calculation. But this particular issue didn't come up, so uh, I don't actually know the answer. Oh, the Venus question is still there. Do we have? Okay. I wanted to answer to uh, Raphael's question about whether we feel anything in the horizon or not. So uh, my feeling is that you know, given the solutions which we have, and you know, essentially there's a huge number of solutions, I don't see any way you can go through there without feeling them. I don't see any way you can go through there respecting the equivalence principle. I mean, I just don't see any way to get flat space, you know, empty space out of just you know many brains polarized on top of each other, you know, doing stuff. I mean, maybe there's some way of you know in which this happens, but you know, to, to me, it just looks to be it, it looks to be highly unusual. So, you know, in that sense, you know, at least the solutions we have don't have any intention to to look like empty space for an infalling observer. Okay, should I quit? Should I close this now? I guess so. Uh, so we should probably move on. It's, we, should, we should also probably take a short break. We've been sitting here a long time, so come back in 10 minutes. And okay.